Chapter 8 The Unexpected Adventure That weekend I decided I wanted to ask Mum some more of my 11 questions to see if she knew the answers. I waited until Sunday morning arrived because that was when I knew Mum wouldn't be too tired and I could ask her lots of things instead of just one or two things. The only problem is I had to be extra extra patient because every Sunday morning my mum spends at least one hour reading the Sunday morning paper. It's not a real Sunday paper because mum never buys them but she says you can buy a whole meal for the price of the Sunday paper these days. So instead all through the week she collects two of the biggest newspapers from the reference section of the library and then on Saturday night she brings them all home and gets them ready for the next day. She opens them out at the centre and puts them all in order so that Monday's papers are on top and Saturday's papers are on the bottom and then folds them together like a big book. It's too heavy to hold and read all 12 big newspapers in one go so Mum always reads it bent over the kitchen table as if she's doing homework. I don't like disturbing Mum when she's reading the paper because she only gets to do it once a week. So I quickly finished my toast and milk and silently stared at her until she finished her breakfast. But grown-ups take an awfully long time to eating breakfast and when they don't have to go to work and on this morning, mum seemed to be moving so slowly that you could hardly call it moving at all. I could hear the ticking of the kitchen clock getting louder and louder and my fingers and legs getting bored of waiting. As soon as mum took the last bite of her toast, I decided I couldn't wait for her any longer and asked, Mum, where's Syria? The question made her look up at me straight away. What did you say, darling? Just, do you know where Syria is, Mum? I said more quietly. My mum pushed off her glasses and looked at me with her head on one side. Then she said, Syria is a country very far away from here, my love. Why do you want to know? I shrugged. That's where the new boy in our class is from. Ah, she said, nodding. OK, tell you what. Why don't you go and get the Atlas book and I'll show you? I nodded and ran to the living room, trying to remember where I'd last put the Atlas book. It's hard finding a book in our house because we have so many of them. Mum loves collecting old books and reading them again and again. She takes the copies that are about to be thrown away by her library. So you could say she rescues them. The only problem is we don't really have space for any more because our rooms are covered with piles of old books, even the toilet. The Atlas book was big, and Mum always kept the very big books on the bottom shelf of our bookcase. So I climbed over the back of the sofa, crawled down into the narrow gap head first to see if it was there. Luckily it was. I grabbed it and pulled it out. The Atlas book is one of the oldest books in the house, and is almost half as tall as me, and just as heavy. So I dragged it along behind me into the kitchen, and placed it with a bang on the kitchen table. I watched as Mum flipped the, to the index and then to the page in the middle. Here you go, she said, turning the map around to show me. The atlas is a little old, but I don't think the borders have changed that much. I let my finger meet hers where it said the word Syria in capital letters and looked at the strange shape of the country the new boy had run away from. It looked like a woman yawning and wearing a tiara and whose hair had been blown in the wind, except she was all pointy. Mum? Hmm? What fruits do people from Syria like the most? I crossed my fingers and toes, hoping she would know the answer, because if she didn't, then I wouldn't then I would know the answers to three of my original questions. I had found out where the new boy was from and what language he spoke, and as a bonus had seen what his country looked like on a map, and learned that he was good at football. Well let's see, I don't really know. I guess the same fruits we do and exotic ones like dates and pomegranates. Your Aunt Selma used to make chicken with pomegranate seeds. Remember? I shook my head. Ah, oh, well, it was quite a while ago. It was before your dad had to leave us. But I think the dish she used to make was a Syrian one. Or was it Lebanese? I can't remember. But here, you see? She pointed to the country next to Syria, which had the word Lebanon on it. Lebanon and Syria are right next door to each other, so I guess they must eat the same kinds of fruits. Can we ring and ask her? Mum smiled. I can ask her the next time she calls. Remember, she lives here now. And Mum pointed to the large country living, lying above Syria called Turkey. It's a bit far and it will be expensive to call her right now. 
But listen, we'll go and see her one day soon. And when we do, you can ask her and Uncle Turge all about it in person. I nodded, but I didn't say anything because I suddenly miss my Aunt Selma an awful lot. It's funny how you can go for long bits of time without even thinking of someone and then suddenly feel all wrong because you realise they're not around anymore. I feel like that about my dad sometimes. It feels horrible when I go to bed and realise that I haven't thought about him all day, not even for a minute. But I always rem remember him at night before I go to sleep because that's when he used to tell me stories and do funny patterns on my forehead so that it tickled. It's different with Auntie Selma though because she's not re my real auntie. So I think of her, it might be okay if I don't think about her every day. She's my mum's best friend because they like laughing at the same things. She has dimples just like I do and she wears a lots of sparkling bracelets and necklaces. She used to live two floors below us with Uncle Turgo and every Sunday night they would invite mum and dad and me down for dinner and give us all sorts of special things to eat. Like bread with spinach inside and a special kind of tea that came in small glasses and didn't have any milk in it. I remember the tea because Dad let me taste it once, but I didn't like it at all. But then, after Dad died, Auntie Selma and Uncle Turge said they were leaving because the economy was being bad. Grown-ups are always talking about the economy, especially in shops and at bus stops and on the news. And they always sound angry or sad when they talk about it. I hate the economy because it made Auntie Selma and Uncle Turge suddenly disappear, just like Dad. They send us pictures and boxes of sweets sometimes in the post and even though I like getting things from them because the stamps are interesting, I can tell that it makes mum sad. Now there's an old lady living in their flat and she never speaks to anyone. I don't think mum could be best friends with her even if she wanted to. I thought about the question again. So people from Syria like pome, pomegranate, pomegranate, mum corrected. Remember, it's like Let's see, one half of pom pom and a delicious letter E that your gran ate, pommy granite. I nodded and said the word out loud three times. I love it when mum comes up with ways to help me remember how to spell or say a word. Last year I had to learn the word conundrum for a spelling test, but I kept forgetting how many nuns or uns there were in it. And then mum told me to close my eyes and picture a man called Ko and a lonely nun banging on a drum. And I've never spelled the word wrong since. I thought about pomegranates and how they might be Ahmet's favourite food and how he might be missing them. So I asked, Mum, can we get one? One what, darling? A pomegranate, I said carefully. Hmm, they're a bit expensive and you can't find them everywhere. How expensive? I'm not sure. About £1.50, I think. What? Nearly £2 for just one? I cried out. You can buy a whole packet of colouring pens and a rubber for that much money. Mum laughed. Yes, darling, for one. They come a long way to get to our supermarkets. And secondly, a pomegranate is also a really special fruit. It's like millions of tiny fruit all hidden away inside a small ball, and you can eat it for days. Oh, I said, trying, to think, trying hard to think of what millions of one fruit inside a ball would look like. She looked at me and smiled. Do you want to see if we can find one? Shall we make it? That's our adventure for today. I jumped up and nodded. But can we get two? I asked. And why would you need two? I think Mum already knew the answer because her lips looked like they wanted to smile. I didn't think she'd tell me off, even though pomegranates are so expensive. But you can never be sure with grown-ups. Sometimes they don't tell you off, even when you've done something you know you shouldn't have. And at other times, when you think you haven't done anything bad at all, they punish you twice as much. Michael says it's so they can keep us on our toes. But I've never stood on my toes when I'm being told off, so I don't see how that works. I want to get two so that I can give one to the new boy, I said. I've been giving him my sherbet lemons and sweets after school, but he didn't like them that much. But then I gave him an apple and an orange, and he liked those better. And Mrs Hemsey said that he's from Syria, and that he only speaks... He only speaks... I hesitated, trying to remember what Miss Hemsey had said. Arabic, Mum asked, trying to help. I shook my head, Ker, Ker, Kurtwish, I guess, knowing it was wrong. Ah, Kurdish. I nodded. I see. I could tell Mum was interested in what I was saying because she had leaned back in her chair and folded her arms. And I thought maybe he'd like fruit he used to have at home. 
before the bullies dropped bombs on everything and made him run away. I stopped, worried that Mum would think that it was silly and maybe a waste of money buying food only to give it away, but she didn't. Instead, she think, said, I think it's a brilliant idea. Go and get ready and we'll head out on a pomegranate hunt. So I got, I got ready so quickly that morning that I think I must have beaten a world record. In five minutes, I pulled on my adventure jeans and my old Tintin jumper, packed my rucksack and my water bottle in a, and a banana, put on my wellies, brushed my hair and emptied my piggy bank. I had exactly four pounds and 20 pence saved up. So I took three pounds, hoping that, just like my astronaut stationery set, I could find two pomegranates that were on sale. First, we went to the fruit stall, and that was at the bottom of our high street. It's run by a man and a woman called Mr and Mrs Marbles, who like to shout, only a pan, oh, fruit and veg, only a pan, to all the people that walk by. Their faces are always red and smiling, and they wear giant square-shaped green belts around their waists, which look like empty, which look empty but jingled loudly when they walk. Mrs Marbles help people pick out their fruit they want, and Mr Marbles puts it in a bag. We always buy our fruits and vegetables from them, and I never know, known them not to have anything we need. But when we asked them for a pomegranate, they both shook their heads at us and told us to try the supermarket. So we walked up and over the hill to the supermarket. They had a fruit section that was as long as our house, but Mum couldn't see a pomegranate anywhere. We went over to the man who was stacking carrots and humming to himself, and asked him if they had any pomegranates in store. He walked us over to the small box, but it was empty. Sorry, love, looks like we've run out. You might want to try with a bigger supermarket on the other side of town. Ah, OK, thank you. Mum looked down at me and sighed. Then she said, come on, the adventure continues. We hopped onto the bus and after half an hour landed at an even bigger supermarket. This one had car parks as big as football fields and corridors as long as the one in schools. But we still couldn't find a pomegranate anywhere. Let's ask someone, said Mum. They must have them. We walked around and found a man dressed in a suit who was standing by a sandwich section. He had a label on his jacket that said Frank Smith, floor manager. I didn't know what a floor manager was, but I guessed that he had to make sure the floor was clean and help anyone who fell down get back up again. But Mr Smith didn't look like the kind of person who would help anyone get up from the floor. He had lips that went downwards as if they never smiled, and his hair looked wet as if it had a large bottle of oil had fallen on top of it. He was staring at a clipboard and muttering angrily to himself. Excuse me, Frank, is it? Hi, said Mum, smiling. The man gave Mum a cold nod before continuing to fill in a long form. We're looking for some pomegranates, but I can't seem to find any, said Mum, smiling even more. We don't sell them here, said Frank, looking down at his clipboard. Oh, really? Any idea where we could find some? continued Mum. No. My mum looked at him for a few seconds and then said in her warmest voice, thank you, you've outdone yourself in helping us today. Have a wonderful day. And grabbing my hand, she walked away. Mum, why were you so nice to him? I asked. He was horrible. He didn't even try to help us, even a little bit. Because you should never be horrible to someone who's being horrible to you, said mum. Otherwise they win by making you just as bad as them. Now come on, let's get back on the bus. There's another place I know that we can try. By this time I was getting hungry, so while we were waiting for the next bus, I ate my banana. Hmm, said Mum, looking at her watch. It was nearly two o'clock and there were some dark grey clouds gathering in the skies. I'm afraid the next stop will have to be our last one, darling. It looks like it's going to start raining in a bit. A few seconds later, a very full bus pulled in front of us and we squeezed on. I clung to Mum's coat because there weren't any empty seats and waited for our stop. I was worried because if this was our last try, then I had one chance left to find a pomegranate. So I crossed my fingers and my toes and made a wish that we would. The next place felt like an awfully long way away. And when we finally got there, it was filled with so many people that we could hardly walk properly. There were lots and lots of market stalls lying in the middle of a big road, all selling, all selling fish and meat and bedsheet and long gold chains. There was a man with a microphone who was trying to sell perfumes like a game show host by shouting, Roll up! Roll up! And next to him was a woman shouting, Peter never picked potatoes as good as these before. Buy them now before they go. I wondered who Peter was and how much money he made by picking potatoes. But then I could smell onions and burgers being cooked somewhere which made my tummy rumble. 
I love burgers, especially ones that have lots of fried onions and ketchup in them. But I wanted to save my money for my pomegranates, so I scrunched up my nose and tried not to smell anything at all. We visited every stall in the market, from the beginning of the street right to the end, but even though we looked as carefully as we could, we couldn't find a single pomegranate. My mum had told me to look for a pinkish ball that looked like a very hard apple, but which had a small crown on the top, but I couldn't see anything that looked even a bit royal. Try the store up by the station, suggested one of the stall order or owners, when mum asked for help. They have everything under the sun in there. They should have some. Thank you, said mum. She grabbed my hand and gave it a squeeze, because she could tell I was starting to give up hope. Nearly there, she, wish she whispered. I can feel it. We walked down for five minutes. We walked for five minutes down the road and up to the station and found the woman in the market had told us about. Found the shop that the woman in the market had told us about. It was much smaller than the big supermarket with Frank the horrible floor manager. But it was bright and had lots of coloured lights and bowls and bowls of fruits and vegetables outside. It had everything you could think of peaches, plums, mangoes and bananas, kiwis and pears, yellow apples and red apples and pink apples, and even a spiky pink and green fruit that I had never seen before. But we couldn't see any pomegranates. So we went inside and Mum asked the man standing behind the counter. Ah, nodded the man, scratching the tip of his nose. Pomegranate, I'll see for you. And then talking out loud to himself, he hurried to the corner of the shop quick and quickly looked through some boxes. Much, much regret, he called out, holding up an empty box. No more, but we have a delivery on Tuesday. The man came back and looked at us, and we looked at him. He had a large white beard and a moustache that was curly at the ends, and he was wearing a bright red turban. I liked him because his eyebrows were like hairy caterpillars, and they jumped up and down a lot when he spoke. Oh well, said Mum. We tried at least. The man looked at me. I think he must have noticed that I was looking sad, because he said, Is it for this little one? I, not, I looked up and nodded. And for my friend, I said. He's new in my class, and he misses home, and that's what he used to have. I see, he said, looking at me with a smile. Then he frowned as if he just thought of something, and suddenly pointing his finger to the ceiling and crying out, Aha! He ran to the small door in the back of the shop and disappeared. Mum and I looked at each other in surprise. He's funny, I said. I like him. He seems lovely, agreed Mum. After a few seconds, the man came back, but instead of returning to the counter, he came and stood in front of us. They are not perfect, but will be okay, he said, and whipping his hands from behind his back, he held two little pink balls that each had a crown on top. Oh, cried out Mum, clapping her hands. You have some. They're a little old. My wife, she says they are not perfect 100%, so we don't sell, you see, said the man, his eyebrows jumping up and down even more. My wife, she knows everything about fruit, so I listen to her most. They're perfect enough for us, laughed Mum, aren't they, darling? I nodded as the man gently handed them to me. You and your friend enjoy, please, he whispered, and tapped me on the nose of the finger that had a golden ring with a large red stone on it. I looked down at the pomegranates. They were the size of grapefruits and had hard peachy pink and brown skin that was smooth and shiny as polished glass. And both of them had a tiny flower on top, made up of exactly seven stiff brown petals. They were the best, most interesting thing I had ever seen. Mum took out her purse because that's, what I had, that's where I had put my pocket money. But the man shook his head and waved his hand. No, no, you must not. It is a gift for the little one. Oh, no, you must let me. The man held up his hands, which made Mum go quiet, and then put her, her hand on his chest. It is a gift. They are not excellent, not new, so a very poor gift. They're the best of gifts, said Mum. Aren't they, darling? I nodded, feeling so happy that I wanted to hug the man and Mum and jump up and down all at once. Thank you, sir, I said, giving the man an enormous smile. Welcome, welcome, he said, and smiling back, he gave me a pat on the top of my head and waved at us as we left the shop. What a wonderful man, said Mum, as she helped me put the pomegranates into my rucksack. He looked like a king, I said, thinking of the ring with the stone in it and his red turban. Mum laughed. He certainly has the heart of one. Maybe he is one. You can never tell with people. Now, seeing as our unexpected adventure is at an end, let's hurry home before it starts to pour. I looked up. 
Everything had started to turn dark and the sky was filling with large grey clouds that were so low you could hear them rumbling. But I didn't care because I had two of the best presents I ever could have had in my bag, given to me by a man with the heart of a king.